Well, previously I was speaking about the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to move further and be able to expound in depth you know, on why it's of great importance for us to simply embrace the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to slightly get back to a place where I will be able to have proper clarity about even our spiritual rebirth as believers. You know, so that we can be able to really be able to understand why is it necessary, why is it very important for us to embrace the Holy Spirit in our daily work. So, I was going to simply be able to speak about the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ, the spirit of life in Christ, the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Of course, that is extracted from the book of Romans chapter number 8. But before we go to Romans chapter 8, I want just to look at what Apostle John look at what he spoke largely about humanity, the creation, and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, and I'm just going to begin for verse number 10. He came into the world, though the world was made through him. Now think about that. The world was made through him. Of course, verse 1 has already given out. And verse number 2 has made us to understand, if I can just read, in the beginning, before all time, was the word, Christ and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 2, He was present originally with God. Verse 3, All things were made, came into existence through Him, and without Him was not even one thing made that has come into being. This is helping us to understand that everything that is existing in the realm of humanity and even beyond it is as a result of our Lord and Savior everything originated or founded in him so and that's now we come to verse number 10 he came into the world Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, did not know him. He came to that which belonged to him, to his own, his domain, creation, things, world. They were not, uh, they who were his own did not receive him, did not welcome him. But verse number 12 says but to as many as did receive welcome him he gave the authority power privilege right to become the children of God that is to those who believe in adhere to trust in rely on his name verse 13 who all their bath neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh so what life is this because verse 13 is helping us to understand that it's a detachment it shows two types of lives here it says who hold their birth this biological life or the biological birth so he says who all their birth neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh so that is the biological life has been ruled out that of physical impulse not to the will of man, that, that of natural father, but to God, they are born of God. They are born of God. So this new life in Christ Jesus is not tied to biological heritage, which is under the Adamic nature. No. This is a life that has been brought to play by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so it says who all their 
but neither to blood not to the will of the flesh so the human blood the flesh the physical impress not the will of man that natural father born to God they are born of God they are born of God now let's carry on and look at John chapter number three which has been more you know Christ has been able to emphasize even much more and shed more uh, bring more light to what we're just talking about here and it has some connection to us chapter number one just just read verse number 12 and of course 13 as well verse number one the Bible says now there was a silent man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler and a leader an authority among the Jews who came to Jesus at night and said to him Rabbi we know that are and are certain that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs this wonder works this miracles produce the proofs that you do unless God is with him Jesus verse 3 answered him I show you more solemnly I tell you that unless a person is born again the Amplified says new from above he cannot ever see nor be acquainted with and experience the kingdom of God so Christ gives Nicodemus the requirement or the kingdom into requirement the kingdom of God then Nicodemus responded they say to him how can a man be born when he's old can he enter his mother's womb and uh, womb again and be born Jesus answered I assure you Muslim I tell you that unless a man is born of water and even the spirit born of water and even the spirit he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God now when you look at the word spirit here is capital S implying that it is the Holy Spirit and there's a person born of the Spirit cannot enter the kingdom of God verse 6 what is born of the flesh is flesh what is born of physical is physical what is born of the spirit is spirit now when you look at your Bible very well you realize that actually what is born of the spirit we have capital S mean, meaning to say the Holy Spirit then the human spirit small s is spirit so what is born of the spirit is spirit remember you're talking about the law the law of the spirit of life in Christ so whatever is born of the spirit is spirit now I want you to understand something very important that only Christ could simply give us this different kind of rebirth by the virtue of his death the cross of Calvary and also of course by the Holy Spirit every other because the Bible has ruled out the human will the flesh the blood according to John 1 13 this is to say this kind of rebirth is divine it is a life that is beyond the realm of the earth it is a life of God and I believe and I know you do know that that God's ultimate desire has always to been to give mankind the life that he has, the life that he intended from you know the first time of creation that eternal life that life without an end that endless life then he says my will Lord do not be surprised astonished at my telling you you must be or be born anew from above the wind blows breathes where it wills 
and though you hear sounds yet neither know where it comes nor where it is going so it is everyone who is born of the spirit so the emphasis is the spiritual rebirth spiritual rebirth and that's why we come to verse number 16 for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he, he even gave up his only begotten son, unique son, so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have everlasting life again. So which life is this? Everlasting life is a divine life, which is always issued by the Holy Spirit through the person of Christ Jesus. Remember I just said you must be born again of the Spirit. What and the Spirit? And the Spirit is actually just an ordinary Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, this is for every single believer. This has nothing to do with you are on this office, this capacity is about we, our spiritual rebirth is key, is very vital. And until you understand on how you've been able to find yourself in God's kingdom, then you will not the person who is behind our entering the kingdom of God, then you'll not be able to understand why you need this person who is the Holy Spirit to be able to help you and even help me to navigate within the frame of the earth and be able to simply like have dominion over all the negatives that are so obvious in this life it takes the holy spirit remember i said must be born again from above now i want to show you Another reading here. Verse 1. He who comes from above, heaven is far above all others. He who comes from the earth belongs to the earth, talks the language of the earth. His words are from an earthly standpoint. He who comes from heaven is far above all others, far superior to all others in prominence and excellence. He who comes from above is above all. Of course, this of course is in the context of uh, John said he must increase and I must decrease. He must grow more prominent and I must grow less. Now, Jesus was born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the birth of John was equally, you know, backed up by heaven. We don't dispute that. But the Bible does not tell us that the birth of John was as a result of the Holy Spirit. No, I know, uh, you know, uh, Elizabeth, the husband, they were old. We do understand that. But somehow, just like in the case of Abraham, they were able to conceive. But we don't see the Holy Spirit the way Gabriel spoke to Mary in Luke chapter number one and said the power of the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. The case is very different. So there was something that is quite different between John and Christ Jesus. If that was not the case, then John could have actually been played a role of being a savior. But then you look at his ministry, John says, you know, I've been assigned to simply prepare the way. And he said, he that is coming, even I'm not what to you know, put my legs into, I'm not what to wear his many sandals. And when Christ was being coming to be baptized, John was actually even trying to say, no, you're the one who's supposed to, I'm the one to be baptized by you, but not, I am not supposed to baptize you. So John kind of understood the person of Christ and who he was. However, he was able to simply quickly 
be able to make people understand who Christ is. Now, I want us to look at what Apostle Paul was able to put to across through the book in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We just look at what Apostle Paul said here. Corinthians 15 and 45 the Bible says that it is written the first Adam became a living being an individual a personality the last Adam Christ became a life-giving spirit restoring the dead life we have the first Adam and the second Adam we're going to talk with Apostle Paul has put it so the first Adam was a living being an individual but the second Adam who is the Christ or is Christ became a life giving spirit so Christ came that's the Bible says in John 3 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so Christ came and became a life giving spirit so this timeless life this spiritual life can all be found in Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior and that's why when people don't simply understand the essence of salvation or being born again they look at things from the surface or from the realm of humanity and they miss out the real objective of why Christ literally came he came to redeem mankind from the bondage of sin and at the same time accord mankind the life of God the eternal life by the virtue of the Spirit you know to enable us while we're in the realm of the earth live the life of God because according to John 1 13 we are born of God and therefore we live a life that is of God while we are in the realm of the earth but then how do we live this life that's why I said I'm going to simply explain uh, you know at length but I wanted just to help us understand just probably establish a background on what I want to simply show about in depth you know in the book of Romans so uh, we do understand that Adam first Adam became a living being but the second Adam was Christ became a life-giving spirit now if you look at John chapter number six People had began walking away from Jesus Christ because of he when had began to speak the, the preaching in the in much more deeper dimension and they could not simply absorb it you know, they could not take it so he came to explain to them verse Number 60, the Bible says, When his disciples had this, many of them said, This is hard and difficult and strange saying, an offensive and unbearable message. Who can stand to hear it? Who can be, uh, who can be expected to listen to such teaching? But just knowing within himself that his disciples were complaining, protesting, and grumbling about it, said to them, Is this a stumbling block? and an offense to you does this upset and displease and shock and scandalize you what then will you will be your reaction if you see the son of man ascending to the place where he was before now look at verse 63 it is the spirit who gives life They didn't know that what Christ was simply putting across to them was a life and not just an ordinary life. 
it was the spiritual life it was the spiritual words that I meant to bring spiritual life in their lives but they don't understand it then it goes further and says and father says the flesh conveys no benefit whatever now we go back again John 1 13 born of God not of the flesh not of the will of man not of physical impulse not of the human blood but born of God then of course John 3 Jesus says what is born of the flesh is flesh so you do understand the consistency so the Bible says that the flesh conveys no benefit there's no profit in it the ones the truths that I've been speaking to you they are spirit and life they are spirit and life that means they have a spiritual life in them and what you need as a people you need this spiritual life this other life that I've been living cannot measure up to this spiritual life that is you know coming from God the father so I want you to be able to understand when I talk about the law of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus for you to be able to understand and more so for you to really be able to get know why you and me will need the guidance the leading the help of the Holy Spirit because this life that is spiritual has someone that is able to make us live this life effectively in a fruitful way and this person is none other but the Holy Spirit so Christ said the word that I speak he says the Spirit is and, and I said again here when you look at verse number 63 it is the Spirit capital S it is the Spirit who gives life he is the life giver remember uh, when we saw in the book of Corinthians as we read in Corinthians first Corinthians chapter number one if I may just uh, read it again it says verse 45 thus it is written the first Adam became a living being an individual personality the second the last Adam rather the last Adam Christ became a life giving spirit again that is a capital S a life giving spirit restoring the dead to life restoring the dead to life so they never understood what Christ was saying in John chapter number six about whatever is speaking it's the spirit that gives life and what the ones that is speaking they are uh, it is the spirit that gives life who gives life he is the life giver the flesh conveys no benefit whatever there is no profit in it the words the truths that have been speaking to you are spirit and life the word that I've been speaking to there are spirit and life the words that have been speaking to there are spirit and life so we need to understand that as believers we have a different life and this life can only be experienced in God's kingdom by the virtue of the Holy Spirit the spiritual life is real and most of one that is guided by the Holy Spirit so when we look at what Apostle Paul was trying to put across in Roman chapter number 8 if you look at Romans chapter 5 chapter 6 and chapter 7 you simply see the issue of the law the issue of the flesh the issue of uh, seeing the struggles that are being put across of course by Apostle Paul and also chapter number 7 
Paul speaks about the struggles, the things that is hard to do, he cannot do them, and he really just tried to, you know, say there is another law that is at work. But then he comes to chapter number eight, you know. Actually says, uh, verse 19 of Romans chapter 7 before you go to Romans chapter 8. For I fail to practice the good deeds. You can read the entire chapter if you have time on your own. For I fail to practice the good deeds I desire to do, but the evil deeds that I do not desire to do, uh, that I do not desire to do, are what I am ever doing. Now, if I do what I do not desire to do, it is no longer I doing it. Is uh, doing it. It's it's not myself, the, the myself that acts, but sin principle, which dwells within me, fixed and operating in my soul. So I find it to be a law, rule of action of my being, that when I want to do what is right and good, evil is ever present with me, I'm subject to its insistent demands. For I endorse and delight in the law of God in my innermost self with my new nature. But I design in my bodily members, insensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, different law, rule of action, or against the law of my mind, my reason, making me a prisoner of the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs, insensitive appetites, the wills of the flesh, unhappy and pitiable, wretched mind that I am, who will release and deliver me from the shackles and the, this body of death. Oh, thank God he will, through Jesus Christ. Of course, there is a remedy, that is a solution. That's what he says, oh, thank God. He looks enslaved in these other verses that explains his frustrations based on this law, as he calls it, the law of sin. But then he says, oh, thank God he will, through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, our Lord. So then, indeed, I of myself with the mind of the heart serve the law of God but the flesh the law of sin so the flesh serves gratifies the law of sin while his heart or his spirit of course uh, does what of my, my, myself uh, with my mind and heart serve the law of God now he comes to verse number eight and it helps us to understand something really very important therefore there is now no condemnation no adjudging guilt of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus comma those who are in Christ there is no condemnation that is judgment justification has been already accorded us but does it end there let's look at it it doesn't end there being Christ is not the end of it all. We are in Christ, but we are within the atrium. And Paul has explained about his bodily members and the struggles, you know. So he gives a remedy and a solution on what the Holy Spirit is more than able to do in our lives in order to, you know, validate or simply enable us to live that life which Christ has paid for and given us that life. Then it says, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh. Remember, he talked about the flesh serves the law of sin and death. It's here. prisoner of the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh so the law of sin which of course eventually of course results to death then it says who walk who live and walk not after the dictates of flesh but after the dictates of the spirit yet the Bible says those who live 
live and walk live and walk that means those who walk in the consciousness of the spirit. In fact, when you look at it, it says, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh. Because we are in this flesh, and the flesh can equally dictate. Because you are born again in the spirit. It's been transformed in our minds. Our bodies will be changed, as the Bible says. But it says, the dictates of the flesh, but are after, but after the dictates of the spirit the one dictate here in the amplified seems to be quite strong you know because the holy spirit is gentle and look at the past the holy spirit he does not like superimpose himself on human will no he doesn't do that but then i'm just going to use this so the dictate that means we have allowed the holy spirit to guide us to lead us to instruct us so people that don't walk according to the dictate of the flesh are the ones that simply find themselves exempted from condemnation from guilt that is as a result of the dictates of the flesh so for us to walk and live a victorious life which is spiritual life while we are in this realm of the earth we have to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us to lead us regardless of who you are this is actually cutting across every single person our lives ought to be guided by the Spirit. Then now, what you're learning about, for the law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life, again, capital S, the Spirit is capital S. The law of the Spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being. Our new being is as a result of the Spirit of God. The law of our new being has freed me from the law of sin and death. So I'm no longer enslaved to sin and a victim of death as a result of sin. I've been set free. This is the chapter of freedom. This is Paul is helping us to understand how we can walk free from the bondage, free from the dictates of the flesh. You know. So he says, the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ, it is in Christ. This life can only be founded in Christ and can be sustained in Christ by the Holy Spirit. So being in Christ requires someone else, the Holy Spirit, to help us become a people that benefit from that which Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary failure to which will be in him but not be able to enjoy victoriously that which he did for us because it will take the Holy Spirit to guide us to enable us to live that life that Christ has given unto us verse 3 says for God has done what the law could not do its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of mankind without the Holy Spirit, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. Look at that. Sending his own son in guise of sinful flesh as an offering of sin, condemned sin in the flesh. God himself condemned sin in the flesh. Which flesh? The flesh of Christ Jesus. Subdued over came, deprived it its power over all who accept that sacrifice. Remember, Christ was not a sinner, was not born of sin. He took the cup of sin, but he was not born in sin. There was no sin in him. I need to explain that. So he took my place in your place of sin. And that flesh was crucified, that sin was destroyed. He became an atonement for the sins of humanity. 
he paid the price he was crucified died where I was to die and where you were to die as well and this was given God gave him as a sacrifice where sin of humanity was concerned that's why John 3 16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting everlasting life everlasting life so that the righteous the righteous and the just required so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully made in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh but in the ways of the spirit who live in the ways of the spirit for this righteousness to be fully effected of what was demanded within the law in the Old Testament for it to be factualized to be materialized it has to be by the way of the spirit not by the way of the flesh but it is the way of the spirit our lives governed not by the standards according to the dictates of the flesh but controlled by the Holy Spirit so it is not about the standard of the flesh but is according to the dictates according to the guidance of the spirit so at the end of the day what Paul is explaining this particular chapter I know theologians have a lot to say about that but then I want to simply help us to understand that what Paul was putting as emphasis was about a Christian walk that is governed by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus it keeps us above the normal challenges that people encounter in this life it helps us to live as victorious and also to be able to live that spiritual life this this spiritual life that is in Christ Jesus according to us by him and we can only experience that life by the guidance of the Holy Spirit verse number five the Bible says for those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desire set their minds on pursuit of those things which gratify the flesh but those who are according to the spirit are controlled uh, by the desires of the spirit set their minds and seek those things to gratify the Holy Spirit so you know those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desire set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh so this is to say that what our flesh craves for will equally have control of our minds and that becomes our thought pattern now we do understand pretty well when uh, in the same book of Romans chapter number 12 when Paul said in verse number 1 of Romans 12 I beseech you brethren offer your bodies as a living sacrifice so that acceptable before the Lord and just let just let me just read I appeal to you brethren and beg you in the view of all masses of God to make decisive dedication to your bodies presenting all your members for college as a living sacrifice wholly devoted consecrated and well pleasing to God which is your reasonable rational intelligent service and spiritual worship spiritual worship then in verse number two says do not be conformed to this world this age fashion after the adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals its new attitude so that you may prove for yourselves so that you may uh, you may prove for yourselves what is good acceptable perfect will of God even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you so that is Romans chapter number 12 so moving on in verse number 6 
the Bible says, now the mind of a flesh, which is his sense, reason without Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises of all or comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and thereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life. Look at that again. The mind of the Holy Spirit is life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That the mind of the Holy Spirit is life, soul, peace, both now and forevermore. Have you ever wondered why even as Christians we find ourselves sometimes you're worked out, we have these anxious thoughts, we have these worrisome thoughts, we have these, uh, you know, we, we just worked out, you know, and sometimes we want to let go give up in life. I have come to realize that actually, unless we allow the Holy Spirit to have such an effect on our minds through the, our own human spirit that is regenerated, we'll find ourselves being slaves of circumstances that are befalling mankind in life. But the Bible says here, that the mind of the Holy Spirit is life, life, and soul, peace, both now and forever. This is to say, even if I go through motions of difficulties, I will not lose this life, I won't lose this peace, and it's not just now, it is forever. That's why you and me as believers, we are going to become different from other people in the world. Even in the midst of difficulties, it is when we allow the Holy Spirit to take charge of our lives, to take the lead of our lives. Verse 7, the Bible says, that is because the mind of the flesh with its carnal thoughts and purposes is hostile to God, for it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So then those who are living the life of the flesh, catering the appetites, of the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please satisfy God and be acceptable to Him. Verse 9. But you are not living the life of the flesh. You ain't living the life of the flesh. Paul says, you are living the life of the spirit. The life of the spirit. Capital S. The life of the spirit. You are living the life of the spirit. That means to say, as believers in Christ, the life you are living is not a life that is simply uh, that reflects what people in the world would simply focus on. Now, this life is not just a life that is carnally oriented or fleshly oriented. No, it's a spiritual life in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says, the Holy Spirit of God, really, if the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, not just dwelling. Now, please look at this, brother, very well. This is Paul. Paul was able to write about two quarters of the New Testament, and God entrusted him with so much revelation that it was meant to benefit and better the church of Christ, and especially these last days. So Paul says, if the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, directs and controls you, uh, directs and controls you, but if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit, that's to say, okay, let me repeat again, but if, but you are not living the life of the flesh, you are living the life of the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, directs and controls you. So when the Holy Spirit dwells in us, is to simply help us walk according to the nature of Christ and more so 
be able to cause us to ex experience the spiritual life that is founded in Christ Jesus. But if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is not of his, he does not belong to Christ, he is not truly a child of God. Now, I go back to what I was teaching about the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is not just now about ministry, but also our identity with Christ. Our identity with Christ, our union with Christ is prompted by the Holy Spirit. He said, if anyone does not possess the Holy because the moment one gets born again, the moment one gets born again, you are, you receive the Holy Spirit. Because, let me say, walking, living a Christian life within the realm of the earth, without the Holy Spirit, it is simply a futile venture. A futile venture. When Christ or disciples don't leave them as orphans, that is going to send them the Holy Spirit. He was not just going to simply help them carry out the kingdom assignment, but at the same time also help them walk in the consciousness of the ways of God. Help them also cultivate their Christian walk with God. That's why they were fearless. That's why they were bold. That's why they were courageous. The disciples. And they were not simply enslaved by the things of this life. No, they were sold out for the God. The focus was beyond the realm of the earth. They were, they, their lives, their lives were beyond this material world. They were living in a different realm. The realm of eternity, the realm of God. And therefore the things that are to happen in the natural life or in the material world, those things could not have an effect on them. Neither enslaved them, neither were they moved by these things. I would want to ask a question that you'd simply, I'd want to hear a response from you. Why do you think most believers in our time, so to speak, and even sadly even some of the ministers, why do we find ourselves so much enslaved to the things of this life? Don't you think, this world rather, don't you think Christ came to give us much more than the material expectation that everybody craves and fights for. And I'm not saying shouldn't have this material blessings. Of course they are. But that was not the ultimate objective. Scripturally speaking, I don't think that was the ultimate objective. No. I'll say this for some reason. Because everything came from God. Nothing was made that has been made, that was made without him. So nothing we see in the realm of mankind that was made outside God, everything came from God. And therefore, you and we have the life of God, that spiritual life that Christ gave us, that eternal life, that puts us in an upper place in a superior place. The Bible says, he that comes from above is above all others. Oh God, is above all others. Where do we get troubled? Where do we get competitive? Why do we become jealous and envious of these things, of this world? It's because you've not understood Number one, our spiritual rate, but number two, we have not simply allowed the Holy Spirit to broaden our understanding, to bring, to illuminate this reality into our rejuvenated spirit, our regenerated spirit, so to speak. So you can have a different perspective when it comes to the matter of this, this life that you're living. I do believe as we keep planning day after day, God will help us by Spirit. 
every conflict you see taking place amongst Christians it is not the work of the Holy Spirit it is the work of the flesh jealous envy you know rivalry uh, all these negative things they are not a product of the Holy Spirit they are the work of the flesh So the Bible says the Holy Spirit does not just is not just to dwell in us but to guide us to control us as a people because his work is to simply ensure that the will of the Father the will of God that which is meant to take place in our lives from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is effected so if we are going to have a great encounter and experience the divine blessing the divine life that has been accorded to us through the person of Christ and cannot be only be brought into reality by the Holy Spirit we must simply do what we call surrender in totality our human will Christ surrendered his will said my father if it's possible take away this cup but I pray not my will but your will be done Jesus said your will have I come to do it's all about the will of God look at the prayer pattern Lord's prayer Luke chapter 11 our father word in heaven hallowed be your name the kingdom come you know your will be done on earth as it is in heaven your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so total surrender of our will will enable the Holy Spirit to help us have this heavenly life this spiritual life this divine life this life that is beyond this normal life this life of the spirit when we surrender our human will but the spirit of Christ rather let me repeat again but if anyone doesn't possess the Holy possess the Holy Spirit of Christ he is none of his he does not belong to Christ he is not a true child of God let me show you Acts of Apostle 19 then we come back to Romans chapter 8 While Paul was in Corinth, Paul went through the upper island districts, came to down to faces. There he found some disciples. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed on Jesus as the Christ? They said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then, and, and he asked, into what baptism? Then why are you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized you with baptism of repentance, continually telling the people they should believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus, in Jesus, having conviction full of joyful, uh, full of joyful trust that he is Christ the Messiah and being obedient to him. On hearing this, they were baptized again, this time in the name of the Lord. And Paul laid hands upon them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in foreign, lang foreign and known tongues, languages, and prophesied. There were about 12 of them in all. So this particular brethren, they had received, they had believed on Christ, but of course through the ministry of John, the Baptist of course John was simply telling the people to prepare 
for the coming Messiah. But now these ones have not, no, had not even heard about the Holy Spirit. They had believed in Christ. And Paul was able to put things clear to them and make them understand. And after doing so, they were able to receive the Holy Spirit. Paul laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That means every believer. It's very important. You cannot live a victorious life without the Holy Spirit of God guiding you in your life. So back to Romans chapter 8. Verse 10. But if Christ lives in you, then uh, although your natural body is dead by the reason of sin and guilt, the spirit is alive. Now our human spirit is alive. Our natural body is dead to sin as a reason of sin. But our spirit is alive. So this body of ours, hundred bit again. Please look at this verse very well. But if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin. Remember I said earlier on, our body is not saved yet. We have not become immortal. We are still mortal. This body still wears out. This body ages. Paul says that even though our outer tent is wearing out, you know, this body sometimes can be plagued with illness. That's how we speak faith on our lives. That's why Christ paid, uh, you know, like took our infirmities, took our sickness and disease on this for the sake of this body. If this body was fully chained that is immortal, then we would not even be sick, not even by any chance. We wouldn't be sick. Wouldn't be going, it wouldn't even be aging. But this body has not been. Paul says we shall be changed. He says mortality must put on immortality. That's what the Bible says. So, the Bible says, But if Christ lives in you, even though natural body is dead by the reason of sin and guilt, the spirit is a lie because of righteousness that, is imp that, that he imputes to you. Now, that's why, if you are going to be exempted from the condemnation and the guilt, according to Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, he says, Walk not after the dictate of the flesh, but after of the spirit. So, again, let's proceed further and look at it. And in the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore you to life, your mortal, short lived, perishable bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You know what that really implies? Christ was raised from the dead. After three days. Of course, Paul is trying to put this across so that actually these bodies can equally come to a place of death. Of course, people die, still people die, believers die, and unbelievers die. But we that are born again, of course, these bodies will be raised again as a result of the Holy Spirit. But again, also, even when you're going through uh, illness or any form of ailment, the Holy Spirit is able to quicken our mother bodies and just like bring healing to these bodies. But then look at what Paul is saying, you know. Uh, look at the context of this particular statement. He said, if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ from the dead will also restore to life your mortal shall live to perishable bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Will restore. You are short lived. So these bodies are short lived. That's why I said again, these short lived perishable. We have these perishable bodies. Now let me show you before you 
say that maybe I'm just saying statements that are not biblically backed up because most people like, you know, I take note as I tell you, verse 51, uh, mystery, secret truth, and event decreed by the hidden purpose of the council of God, we shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed, transformed. In a moment of a twinkling of an, or a twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ. Now, now you can be able to look at what Paul said in Romans, that the Holy Spirit that raised Christ if it dwells in you will also be able to restore your bodies back to life anyway. Let me proceed to say is Christ will be raised imperishable, free and immune from decay and we shall be changed and transformed free from free and immune from decay and shall be changed as 53 for the perishable part of us must put on imperishable nature and this mortal part of us this is uh, this nature that is capable of dying must put on immortality freedom from death you see what i was talking about so paul says we shall be changed we shall have put on that which is not able to die because this body is not changed yet and that's why it's critically important for us to simply live our lives subject to the guidance of the holy spirit according to the book of romans so i'm back to the book of romans i'm back to rome in the book of romans chapter 8 so we just read verse number 11 so we go to verse number 12 of romans 8 so then brethren we are debtors so brethren we are debtors but not to the flesh we are not obligated to our kernel nature to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dicts of the flesh that means to say we are not meant to gratify every demand that is of flesh and is totally not in tune or in line with god's will and purpose so we are not indebted to the flesh no we're not under any obligation to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set by the dicks of the flesh. And I see this playing loud in our time. The flesh playing so loud in our time. You know, it is hard to say, but this is true. Verse 13 says, if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you are habitually putting putting to death, making extinct, deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. So you see, it's kind of a war. You know, it's kind of a war. That's why I said initially that actually total surrender to our human will is of great importance when it comes to the Holy Spirit guiding us. And the flesh will definitely put us in a state of we have those desires of the flesh. And for us to simply avert that and to avoid living according to the standards of this life, then we have to simply ensure that we totally surrender and subject everything else that is not simply glorifying the Lord. Now look at your Bibles. For all who are laid by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now I, look at this. For all who are laid, the word is laid by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Our sonship becomes valid when we remain subject to the leading of the Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, we just read last time in our previous message, Christ was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. We have to be obedient, submissive to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That is going to simply affirm our sonship as God's children. 
For the spirit which you have received is not the spirit of the slavery to put you once in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit producing sonship in bliss which you cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies together with our own spirit, assuring that we are children of God. Now let me explain something very important here. Sometimes I find believers, and it's very unfortunate, who feel so less in churches when they go to fellowship because they want to use the standard of this world to simply make themselves feel affirmed and feel important. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit of God, number one, He bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, not with our flesh, but with our spirit. This life we are living, Paul said pretty well, you are living the life of the spirit. So when you go to the place of fellowship, you must look at yourself as a person that is living in another realm. The realm living, you know, the person that is having this spiritual life within you. Most of the things you have encountered in the church of our time, within our time, is these things are prompted by our flesh. Our carnal nature has been predominant in our Christian gatherings. I mean, we are jealous, we are envious, we, you know, begin to say we can sabotage others. We, we are competitive, our pride, our ego, our arrogance, it's all a product, or it's all the works of the flesh. The Holy Spirit is not behind pride, is not behind jealous, is not behind arrogance, is not behind all these fleshly acts. The Holy Spirit glorifies the Father, glorifies Christ honors the Father by doing that which the Father expects to be done in our lives and through our lives. Who is this that makes you less in the Christian gathering? What criteria does he use to make you feel less? Why do you always feel you are less? Why do you want to rely on human persuasions to prove that you are important? Listen. When you have the Holy Spirit of God, no one can demean you. No one can devalue you. No one can make you become inferior. No one can turn you down. No. No one. Because number one, wherever you are, the Bible says the Holy Spirit, is why we are not saved the Spirit of the world to be born again, but I see the Spirit that prompt us to call God, Father, the Sonship, Spirit. And then he goes further and says that the Spirit of God bears witness with the Spirit that we are the children of God. It's not some. You that is born again, you that have the Holy Spirit, He bears witness with your Spirit that has been regenerated that you are a child of God. Self-awareness is a result of the Holy Spirit. And that's why some people are doing things to feel accepted. No. If God the Father has accepted you, if He has received you as you are, and the Holy Spirit will communicate to you all the time, help you to understand who you are, help you to understand your God given assignment, help you understand and know your value in Christ Jesus. It is sad to say today. We have used the material world to overlook and demean others. And I keep asking myself, could that be the Holy Spirit? Is it that not be the Spirit of the world? Because the Spirit of the world will always be behind all those kind of things. Literally. Why demean someone because you seem to be high, high in life and stuff materially? Why? You have the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit, they have the Holy Spirit. What is this that can simply supersede having the Holy Spirit in our lives? What is this? 
when every function that is make, meant to be taking place is he's the one behind it then how would you simply overlook and demean another person if the church will begin to embrace the holy spirit i believe we'll have less or even none of these conflicts that always emerge as a result of these carnal cravings the holy spirit is to take over and to be in charge of the church of christ in these last days as he has always been and you as a believer allow him give him that particular chance to take the lead in your life he will make the presence of the father the presence of christ real in your life you will not simply have to struggle to find no he will simply make his god's presence the presence of christ to be so evident in your life as a person So it's very important to be able to appreciate the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Look at Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 16. No, verse 15. Verse 14, Paul begins, let me read from verse 14. Or oh, verse 13 rather. For you brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity, opportunity rather, or excuse for selfishness. But through love, you should serve one another. 14. For the whole law concerning human relationship is compiled in one precept. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. Verse 15. But, that but it's because he had foreseen. Because he began from chapter 3, who has bewitched, all those kind of stuff, you know. So, when you look, I was trying to simply tell them exactly the condition in which they were in. But then he says, like, this is what was foreseen. But if you bite and devour one another in part and strife, be careful that you and the whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. Paul was simply putting across and saying, don't become enemies of yourselves. Where the church, most of the people in the church have really, this is what we are seeing rather in the church. The church has become the enemy of itself. We have become enemies of ourselves. Why? But if you buy to devote one another in partisan strife, be careful that you and your whole fellowship and are not and, and fellowship are not consumed by one another. You know, it's very easy for believers to be negatively used to devour each other. But how does Paul help us to caution? Or how does he caution us? How does he what solution does he provide other than just simply cautioning? He comes to verse number 16. It says, But I say, walk live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, then you will then you will certainly not gratify the cravings, the desires of flesh, the human nature without God. Again, he simply says, the only way you're going to avert all these partisan wranglings, this strife, this thing that display the carnal nature, is when we walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit. Responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh of human nature without God. Again, the issue is the flesh, the issue is the carnal nature. Because again, as I said, this body has not been changed. And for us to subject this body, it has to take the Holy Spirit of God. If you walk in the Spirit, if you are guided by the Holy Spirit, then this human 
cravings that sometimes are oppressive to what the spirit desires will be subjected. Now look at the next verse. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. Godless human nature for these are antagonistic to each other, continually withstanding in conflict with each other. So they're not free, but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. But if you are guided and led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Then he goes further and gives you know, now the doings, the practice of the flesh are clear, obvious. They are immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealous, anger, ill temper, selfishness, division, dissensions, party spirit, functions, sects with, uh, with peculiar opinions, heresies, envy, drunkenness, crossing, uh, and like I warned beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then it comes. And speaks about the fruit of the spirit which I'm not going to talk about now but then uh, this is to say that if you're going to simply live a life but I can just read for you for the sake of those who want to hear about the fruit of the spirit but the fruit of the spirit or the Holy Spirit the work which his presence within accomplishes is number one love number two joy Joy is very different from happiness. Joy, when you have the Holy Spirit, you don't pray for this thing. You don't pray for love. You don't pray for joy. It becomes obvious. Joy, gladness, peace, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faith, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, con uh, continence, again, such things. I can such thing there is no law that can bring charge. And those who belong to Christ the Messiah have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature with its passion and appetites and desires. From 25. If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God. Let us go forward walking in line our conduct controlled by their spirit. Luke 25, if we live by the Holy Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line our conduct controlled by the spirit let us not become vain glorious and self conceited competitive challenging provoking irritating to one another envying and being jealous of one another now look at what paul is saying as he comes to the closure of chapter 5 of galatians these things were probably taking place in the Galatian church at that time. This birthness was able to first what was taking place. But these things are happening in our time as well. All the things that Paul has put across at the wax of the flesh, they are so obvious in our time. You'll find jealousy in church, you'll find anything judges you in churches, you'll find lustful acts, you'll find selfish desires, you'll find all these things that Paul has mentioned, you'll find them in churches today. But what is the problem? Because we always presume that we can simply walk a victorious life, a victorious Christian life, without the Holy Spirit. Paul has emphasized, re re emphasized repeatedly. He has spoken in the book of Romans, he's repeating the book of Galatians, he has spoken in different places. Walk habitually in the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. If we don't do so, this was is a it's a daily requirement. It's a daily requirement. It's like a child when they wake up and they want to go to school, the parents will take them, go with them, you know, until you grow and mature. Even if you mature, you remain submissive and subject to the Holy Spirit. 
there are things that we're not even be praying for. We will be able to grow those things if we are only going to embrace the Holy Spirit and allow Him to take the lead in the church of our time. How can fellow ministers plot on how to take another minister down because they seem to be doing well in comparison to them? The Bible has even talked about heresies. Heresies are as a result of the flesh. It's here. Heresies has been mentioned. Idolatry. Verse 20 of Galatians 5. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealous, anger, ill temper, selfishness, divisions, dissensions, uh, party, uh, party spirit, uh, functions, sects with peculiar opinions, and heresies. You know. All these things are as a result of the flesh and that is with that because the Holy Spirit cannot simply be behind all these things so even as believers as we share with believers as we teach believers we have to be able to come back to the basics and the basics require the person of the Holy Spirit to walk along with every believer not just like in the area of serving, but even our Christian conduct, it takes the Holy Spirit. And even more so when it comes to serving, is another issue. Today you hear utterances that are being put out there by people that are called believers, and you can be shocked. We have so much fighting the social media downgrading, downplaying other ministers over other ministers. And I'm not talking about those that are totally erratic or those that are totally somehow cultic, uh, those that are totally believing in other things. I'm talking about just fellow, fellow believers, fellow ministers. You know, we are always in the body of castigating, you know, just doing things that you wonder is this the work of the Holy Spirit? Can the church be divided like this if it's guided by the Holy Spirit? What has happened is the carnal nature is kind of showing up, puffing up. No wonder Paul said, because the abundance of revelation was given unto me to keep me from puffing up, from being proud. A thorn in the flesh was assigned to me. Paul was so blessed in the matter of revelation and to avoid him from puffing, that means probabilities of puffing up based on our achievement can easily, you know, take place. We read for you. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. This was Paul speak about himself, but in a way that seems to be totally different as a parable of like as if it was another man that was him. Uh, verse five of Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse five says, Of this same man's <coughs> experience I I'll boast, but of myself personally I will not boast except as regards my families and weaknesses. Should I desire to boast, I shall not be weightless, braggart, for I shall be speaking the truth, but I abstain from it, so that no one may form a higher estimate of me than is justified by what he sees in me and hears of me. Now, verse 7. 
to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated and by exceeding greatness preeminence of these revelations they were given me a thorn splinter in the flesh a messenger of sight and to rack buffet harass me to keep me from being excessively exalted think of this is paul speak about himself God foresaw that Paul could become proud based on the abundance of revelation that God had given him. And to keep him safe from not puffing up because God, you know, he resists the proud. He wanted to use Paul and he could not allow to say, he didn't want to see Paul raising in, because use the word puffed. Puffed up means, you know, just being proud, let me put it that way pride taking the lead in your life and so so, so so as I was saying about Apostle Paul you know to keep him from being puffed up and to not to miss out on God's plan and purpose for his life and for God to keep him as an instrument of his will during his time in order to benefit to better the body of Christ or to minister the word of Christ a thorn in the flesh was assigned to Apostle Paul to keep him from being proud. The truth is, humanly speaking, we can find ourselves in a set of pride. Satan himself, Lucifer, we know very well that what simply prompted him to be cast out of heaven was because he became proud according to Ezekiel 28. If you look at it pretty well, his heart became proud. He wanted to simply make himself like the most high. Isaiah 14 speaks of the same from verse number 12 so it's important we do understand that the Holy Spirit will keep us humble he'll keep us submitted he'll keep us in a way that we shall remain subject to the will of God you know so I've just explained that we must allow the Holy Spirit I'll keep on sharing further the Holy Spirit when it comes to ministry at large but we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to see the great move of God if we're going to remain united as believers if we're going to work in harmony as believers we have to allow we have to deliberately refuse this negative carnal status of ours from taking the lead but we love the Holy Spirit to take the lead we have no celebrities in God's kingdom, but only servants. The celebrity disposition that has spread out in these last days in the Church of Christ. God is not raising celebrities. God is raising servants. Ministers that are going to serve God. With that acknowledgement that it's not about them, but it's about Christ. Who is the center of focus. I would like to simply say what? Dr. Mensah Otterbill said one, in one of his messages that today we have not simply put Christ as the focus but we have put men as focus. It's no longer about Christ but it's about us. May God help us. Robert Lyadon also said one day in one of his messages that today we have what he calls celebrity ministers in the kingdom while the great ministers of God in those past years they never displayed such but I believe God will help us by spirit to remain humble and true to this great calling and responsibility of the kingdom assignment God bless you do you good and keep watching over you and remember allow the Holy Spirit to take the lead and charge in your life and we shall see great things happening to the glory of God. Shalom. Peace. God be with you. Amen.